That's perfect. And so I'll assume everyone can hear me and we can uh, can talk. Uh, first, I want to thank Franca for the introduction. Uh, actually, that's it's true. My story started with quantum chemistry, and I started going edging and inching towards uh, drug development every every new step. And today, I want to talk to you about the the use of uh, uh, some techniques of ensemble docking, basically to repurpose drugs against Zika infections. So before I go into this, uh, into detail, uh, uh, I want to just tell you where I'm from. Basically, I had my, I, I was born in Brazil. Uh, can, can you see the pointer? I'm trying to point there. Uh, I can see it, so I the rest born. can see it too. Okay, good. Uh, I was born uh, in this area in Brazil, Brasilia, but I was raised basically in Recife, which is the northeast. And it's a very uh, warm country. Uh, actually, it's a very warm area, basically. Temperature always around uh, between 20 and 30 degrees Celsius like most of the year. So the pictures as you see here. And for me, it's a bit different being being in, in the Carolina now, it's a temperature is rarely, well, basically around zero Celsius most of the time here. Uh, but anyway, uh, I'll, I'll show you a little bit about what we do so we can get to what I'm doing right now. And our interest usually is basically on the use of, it started by, by using molecular dynamic simulation. So, uh, for example, I'm showing here a couple of studies that we've done. The one on the left is uh, a molecular dynamic study uh, of how DNA is transported through some, uh, some proteic nanopores. And we can, with molecular dynamics, we can actually see this, this process happening. And in this case, we were studying how does the, this, the DNA molecule interacts with the pore. With uh, in, in that time, it was uh, the goal was to study the idea of using this nanopore for rapid DNA sequencing, so you could differentiate uh, how does uh, this thing happen. Uh, on the on the right side, you have a simulation that we've done for small peptides. This is like 30, 40 uh, residues. And uh, oh, um, this, uh, so like 30 to 40 residues. And uh, it, it's, it's very hard to determine their structure. They don't have a structure, a definite structure. So we have to resort to some molecular simulations to try to understand what's the most common form that they assume in solution for designing uh, drugs that can bind to them, for example. And other things interesting is a collaboration that we have with another professor in the laboratory in the in a university, Jean Bosco, about uh, how this, uh, this, we can use molecular dynamics also to understand about the stability of, uh, for example, in this case, the DNA in some different environments, right? I'm just putting it there to show you a little bit what we do. Uh, another student of mine is studying uh, an, an alternative mechanism for this T. cruz uh, enzyme called the transialidase. It has to do with the way Trypanosoma cruzi uh, evades the uh, the immune system. So this this enzyme is, is responsible for the mechanism by which, which it evades the immune system, and we're looking into how exactly does it work? So that would be uh, to give us, an, us an, a better idea of uh, different uh, possible treatments. And one is uh, that I think is a very interesting thing is that we can go a little bit beyond what regular molecular dynamics can do. We can do quantum chemical simulations mixed with molecular dynamics. There's the QMMM techniques to actually study reactions that can happen in the protein. And those reactions, they, uh, 
it, it, this cannot be simulated with regular molecular dynamics. We need a, we need to put quantum mechanics with it. And in this case, it's a study done by uh, Maria Carolina, which is was a, a postdoc in our lab. Uh, she did a PhD with us and was a postdoc for some, for a while, where they could actually study how the the dengue protease works, and we could map this uh, mechanism in detail. This is very interesting for developing a new binder for dengue. We had a different study on this. Uh, I, I could show it another time. Uh, and something that's related to it, we're doing that similar study now with the yellow fever uh, protease. It's a, the yellow fever is another viral uh, a disease that's it's coming back again in Brazil. It every once in a while it pops up again. So we're actually studying the possibility of creating a, a new drug specific for yellow fever. So you see, our our focus is uh, in a most of the time is focused on, on those that so-called neglected tropical diseases. And uh, another way we can tackle it is uh, after. We can also do, well, uh, most people have heard about the docking technique. So in this case, we can actually scan databases. Once we have a structure, we can use databases of molecules and scan them through docking to find possible ligands that could be better uh, inhibitors for the, the protein. Okay, so that's the idea of using docking to it. So another think we also look there is, is this. Uh, so, and I, well, and, and another thing that we've been trying to do is to create a database, I'm, I'm sorry for the Portuguese there, but it's basically creating a database of molecules that have been tested against those neglected diseases. So basically we have, uh, have a student that's just scraping data from publications and, uh, and try to get data about uh, structure and uh, 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 PK, uh, uh, IC50s, EC50s of those molecules that we can use for future uh, uh, modeling. Well, but our, our interest today is talking about our work with the Zika virus. So I'll give you a little bit of an introduction on Zika so you, you see the you, you get a better idea of the problem we're facing here. Uh, and uh, Zika is a mos mosquito-borne disease. That means uh, it's the, the vector, what, what carries the disease is a mosquito. And in this case, there's a specific mosquito, which is the Aedes aegypti, that carries Zika virus, and not only Zika virus, this, this mosquito, mosquito carries other viruses uh, like dengue, it's very well known, chikungunya, uh, and there's some evidence that it can also carry the yellow fever. Uh, this, this, uh, it's a kind of a mild disease, just flu-like symptoms. Okay, and uh, it's mostly found in tropical and subtropical climates, and that is uh, because the to spread the disease, the mosquito needs to. Well, you need the mosquito as the vectors. Uh, I'll show in a in the next image. Uh, and this mosquito is very well adapted to reproduce in urban environments. So we can lay its eggs on any uh, any amount of water in a couple of, in, in like seven days. This its eggs turn into new mosquitoes, and it used it to be that it could only use clean water. But now studies have shown that it's already adapted to use even uh, uh, dirty water. So it's evolving on this, uh, it's quickly evolving on this, this thing. And in those tropical climates, we have a lot more humidity around and uh, good temperatures for it to reproduce. And the problem with those diseases is that there's no specific treatment to it. Okay, and the only thing that we can do is try to control the vector. There are some studies on, on vaccines, but nothing that actually uh, works right now. Uh, in Brazil specifically, 
we have if, if you see here i'm showing this uh, 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 on this plot i'm showing the cases of of zika probable cases of zika in brazil uh, from uh, in the green line is the cases from 2018 okay and uh, it 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 shows that we had about this is a by epidemiological week so every week we have around we had in 2018 you can see in average we have about 180 new cases of zika uh, you see that it's a big increase in which is uh, the, uh, the, uh, the time of uh, right of the summer in brazil uh, so this is the you see the, it's it's largest in this this kind of the beginning of the year when it's warmer more rain uh, and uh, we see here in red what's in 2019 already uh, in the beginning of the year we already had about uh, 200 250 cases per week and there's some projection that it might fall but it's not completely well this is the, this is just a projection right we, we can take tell you for sure and most cases now are in, in in areas like far from the big cities because there's been a, a very a, a strong attempt to combat zika around those the, the, the most populated areas and also because once you get it the then you immune immune to it so there's no new cases around this this area uh, for now uh, and the Zika, well, it's not a new disease. It's uh, the first known case was uh, it was first documented in 1947, uh, and uh, it spread from it's, it was found in a forest called a Zika forest in in, in Uganda, and it went to Malaysia. It went to Nigeria, Malaysia, and it started spreading slowly. Just small, uh, uh, the small outbreaks in different places, but it got a lot more more knowledge. It got more a lot more uh, visible after its last outbreak that happened after 2014, 2015 in Brazil and South America. So it's not really new, and the symptoms are kind of mild. But at these places is when we found out the possibility that. Uh, Oh, uh, is, I'm sorry. Uh, the possibility that Zika can oh, lead to this uh, the symptoms that's called the, the microcephaly, the from the congenital uh, Zika syndrome, and Guillain-Barré uh, syndromes. There are, are some uh, uh, cause some paralysis. Uh, usually affect the central nervous system, and that's when the whole uh, the whole worry about Zika actually started in the world, uh, basically because we're worried about those two symptoms. They're kind of rare, but they do happen. And we had uh, sometimes the the symptoms don't the, the basic symptoms don't even appear. The symptoms are uh, only show up in about one every five cases. But still, even without the the, the, the Zika symptoms. They can still, if a woman's pregnant and acquires the Zika, they can develop this uh, microcephaly cases, which it was the, the, the worst thing we had there. Well, but uh, just um, so it was in uh, it was in 12, 6, 2016 that. Uh, a group from our university back in Brazil finally could link positively link Zika to these uh, uh, microcephaly cases, and, uh, and that's got it. Uh, that's when it got re really hit the news there. And the problem with those is that how can we combat those viruses? In most cases, there are some works, uh, some some vaccines in being studied now okay. and uh, some uh, vaccines in development they have 
they still couldn't solve all the the details on the vaccines there's something about the cross reaction of the dengue and possible uh possible problems with the dengue or when, when a person gets dengue after zika and so so there's still not this is work ongoing but it's still not uh, developed so most of the efforts from governments basically are in the combat of the vector so the, and that means uh educational work trying to educate people to not have water in their home uh, standing water that could be used for the by the vector to reproduce and and that's basically it that's all that they got and this is all dependent on government policy of the moment whatever is working uh, whatever the, the the political uh bias of the moment is working but as far as drugs from what after you already get the disease well there's no okay so there's nothing you can do once you already get the disease besides taking tylenol in water so the 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 efforts on vaccines are very important. The efforts on the vector are important, but we also consider that having a specific drug, it's important after you already get the disease. And one example of this is what happened to yellow fever, that we had vaccine for yellow fever, but for you know, problems in public policy, not enough money to vaccinate everyone. And so suddenly we saw last years, last couple of years, we saw a resurgence of yellow fever in some areas in Brazil. They're close to the habitats of, uh, close to the jungle habitats. So they could get the, the, the disease just started reappearing there. Something that was supposed to have this, to have been uh, eradicated long, long time ago. And still the diseases can come back. So it's always good to have to know what we can use against it. So our efforts are basically in trying to develop new drugs that can be used specifically against the disease for someone who already got the disease. So let's take a look at the Zika virus to understand a little bit more about it. Uh, and the Zika virus is a uh, flavivirus okay, from the Flaviridae family. And if we uh take a look here on this section of this uh, of this phylo phylogenetic tree you'll see that zika virus is uh, there's some strains of zika here uh it's very related to this uh, uh, japanese encephalitis virus and to yellow fever virus and dengue okay, so they're very similar types so both all of those are flaviviruses uh, just together with uh, with uh, uh, hepatite C virus and, and some some other in this family, and uh, it has the, the the Zika is known for there are three known lineages of Zika, the one that's, that's the, the West African, which is the, the oldest one, and it's uh, it uh, kind of split into what happened in East Africa and the Asian. And this Asian lineage is one that, that was uh, located in Brazil in 2015 and uh, in, uh, <clears throat> and, uh, uh, in the, the, the South America. Uh, as for the, the morphology of the virus, this virus, it, it makes uh, an icosahedrocapsid. It's like a, a little ball uh, and uh, it it has a, a number of different proteins that make this this capsid, and those proteins enclose a positive sense RNA inside. So when it gets into the cell, in the cell, this uh, basically the the virus, it's uh, it gets into the cell. It's uh, this uh, uh, it's endocyted into the cell. After it's in, there's a, a pH change that opens the cell and releases the RNA into the into the cell. Okay. And when it's in the, in the into the ER at this pH, it starts reproducing and making more uh, more and more copies uh, of itself. The 
uh, and in this in, in this system here it needs this rna we need some of our own machinery from the, in the that's in the in the ar to reproduce to turn this rna into proteins and to the, the proteins that make up the virus okay. so what it does is uh, it produces this this big called the polyprotein of the the virus polyprotein and this polyprotein is it has then it then has to be uh, cut in specific places to produce the proteins that make up the virus so basically they have the structural proteins uh, uh, the 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 AM the E and the C proteins that will make the the capsid and they have a bunch of non-structural proteins there are this NS one two uh, up to NS five there are the virus machinery to reproduce itself okay? uh, so basically those are involved in the reproducing reproduction and those are involved in the creation of the the capsid for the virus. <laughs> As it reproduces, so it makes this big, uh, it it makes this big uh, polyprotein, and the polyprotein needs to be cut in specific places. Some of those cuts are done by the by our own peptidase peptidases, and some by a protease that's in the Golgi complex. But in some places, as you see here, these small triangles here, it is uh, the, the, the protein that's responsible for cleaving is the NS3 protease from the virus itself. Okay? And that's interesting, because the virus has to make this protein, uh, and the, the virus protein is responsible for cleaving some specific places in the polyprotein. So the idea here is that if we can somehow stop this process here, the, the, the process of reproducing the virus, then we could have a medicine that works specifically for it. This process basically is what was used to create medicines for uh, hepatitis C. It uses the, about the basic thing is that they're, uh, they're protease inhibitors. So looking at that, a couple of targets here are the NS3 protease and the uh, another interesting target is the NS5. Uh, which is, I'll, I'll show you a little bit in, in, in a moment. So what we've done, uh, one, one example that we've done, I'm not gonna talk too much about it now, but we use it hybrid QMMM calculations to understand the mechanism of the Zika virus, the reaction mechanism here, which would allow us to search for better uh, uh, compounds that kind of mimic the transition state of the reaction, but I'm not going to go into details on this. Uh, what I'm going to talk today is something that started with the uh, Biosoviet Scientific Challenge that was in spring 2017. It took a little bit longer than we expected at the time and for, for to realize, but actually the job actually went further than, than, than we expected at, at that time. But it's a very interesting challenge. I actually recommend anyone to with some interest in it. If you have some project there, I really recommend it uh, to apply. Uh, but what, what was born from this are two things. The first, um, I'm gonna tell you about so this uh, uh, high throughput screening, but it's a virtual high, thru, high throughput screening to this NS5 RDRP, which is RNA dependent RNA polymerase. And uh, this this uh, 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 protein has has the function of unwinding the RNA so it can be reproduced, so it can be copied by the, the machinery there. And in our case, we were basically we were approached by professors Lindomar and Ronaldo Oliveira from Recife, in that they found out this molecule, that's uh, uh, 6 mmpr could experimentally inhibit this NS5 uh, RGRP in the Zika virus. So 
we wanted to find out how it does because we, we all we had is data is that that it does inhibit the action inhibit the, the virus growth so how we can do it we try to find out how it works and uh, if it's possible to generate new molecules that are at least as active as this one so this the, the procedure that we used was uh, basically first tested this flex method we searched for a binding site on the surface of the protein we created a pharmacophoric model based on the uh, on the uh, on the on the substrate and then we use this model to filter a database of compounds it could refine the final compounds we got we could refine with the height and we could get some interesting results there so just to show you this uh what well, the re-talking part when they actually tested the method we use it there were no structures with a, a ligand for the ns5 from zika but there was a very related one from dengue virus with a with a, a ligand bound and uh, we could basically reproduce the same structure there we looked at the many different pockets in the surface of the protein we actually tested uh by uh tested binding this uh the ligand into every one of the possible pockets in the surface of the protein and we saw that the most uh that it, the the best results was really with the structure of it bounced exactly on on top of the crystal structure so it was a very nice result showing that the method works well for this kind of enzyme so we could use it to the zika one which is very much related to it so we did a similar thing we looked for the make us a, a pocket search on the surface of the zika ns5 we could find some neighbor pockets here uh, as i'm showing you this picture uh, and those are where it binds with most, uh, with the best uh, uh, binding energy, actually the flex, uh, uh, the flex uh, uh, score. And we built a, a larger pocket that includes all of those uh, uh, pockets here, and we made sure to include the catalytic asps. And from that, we could, from that, uh, uh, for the search, we also tried searching with this. Uh, actually, this search was made with the 6 MMPR molecule, and we could find uh, the kinds of hydrogen bonds that this molecule makes with the environment around it. So, what uh, we could map, what are the most important features of this molecule here? We could use, and then we could use this data. I'm just showing here what's the best uh, pose there for the 6 MMPR on the on the pocket on the, the, the cavity and then we could use this data to have an idea of what are the important features to be to search for in the in the molecule okay on, on a molecule that could bind the this uh, protein there so what we did in the time that was uh, we used this drug bank because the idea is to have a drug they could be used uh, on Zika as fast as possible. So we look into a database of drugs. In this case, the drug bank contains over 10,000 drug entries, but it also, it has 1,700 molecules that have already been approved for use with humans. And that is important because whatever drug we could locate here could already be immediately used in, in humans. They had already had all the necessary tests so it was just a, a point of repurposing it for for this uh, Zika virus. So we started from a total of uh, the, well, this is the total that's in the database. Uh, if you look only for the active the, the the molecules that have already been approved, that they were only 1,700 molecules, and then we can filter those by those who have only one donor and three hydrogen bond acceptors to follow about the same. Uh, uh format as the molecule that uh, the that we found at 6 mmpr and that reduced the database to 944 compounds and if you go a little bit further uh we talk with we try to talk all of those using flex and only 315 of those actually successfully docked into the active site and from those 
we can uh, we can take only the ones that had uh, we can rescore with height and take only the ones that had a better score than the original drug. That's those three there, and one of them was uh, antipsychotic, one of was hormone, and one of the kinase inhibitor. And uh, I think it's very interesting to have an antipsychotic there because being a drug that can uh, that, that already needs to that can already uh, get into the central nervous system, it's basically a drug that could fight the Zika infection in the uh, as it affects the brain. Right? We know we know it affects the brain development, so it could get it there. Uh, those drugs are actually uh, we have a bunch of suggestions. We were trying to purchase the drugs to test. And we also, in, in conjunction with Professor uh, Ronaldo, uh, were thinking of new modifications to the 6MMPR to can, that can be even better. Uh, and, uh, and well, this is one part uh, of the thing. Uh, we doing this uh, studies with this, uh, with the, the, the RNA polymerase, but the other part of it, we're, we're looking at the different targets. So the other part of it is the NS3 and S2B protein. In this one, we used a slightly different uh, methodology because basically all of this previous talking that I was showing you, it was, uh, they were done using considering a, a rigid receptor. So basically the structure of the protein is whatever we get from the PDB database directly. And uh, uh, at most we try to correct for missing residues on the PDB database, but that's it. But the fact is, molecular proteins are not rigid. Proteins are a dynamic thing that's always moving. They have uh, little vibrational modes and breathing modes. Uh, and they have different uh, equilibrium structures. So we have to consider that we have to consider this flexibility of the protein in the in the dark. In the, the best thing would be, if possible, to really uh, allow the protein to adapt every time a ligand approaches it, which is not very easy to do. So we could do something that get, gets close to it. So to consider this receptor flexibility, the idea that we used is something that's called ensemble docking. Uh, uh, the ensemble docking, it, it would, the, the idea behind it is basically that we, we will, instead of consider just one uh, specific fixed structure for the, for the protein, Unfortunately, we cannot we cannot just dock it. Uh, we cannot let the protein move too much as as you approach the ligand. But what we can do, we can assume the the that the ligand binds to the protein when the protein is in its best uh, state. It's in a state where it can we can it can fit the ligand better. So what we do is we let's consider how this molecule moves, how this protein moves without the, the, the ligand in place. So we did a very large molecular dynamics calculation with a, over 800 nanoseconds molecular dynamics calculation of the, ver, the, the Zika virus NS3, NS2B protein in its free state, okay? So we have this, this simulation that is basically a movie of how the molecule moves, how the, the protein moves in solution. And from this movie, we uh, use, it's, it's not a random thing, we use some uh, methods to group the structures that it has, uh, that they, so it, it has many different structures, but it can kind of group them into groups that represent, uh, that can be represented by one uh, central structure in this group. So basically they have, different positions they can assume. And it, during the, the course of a long molecular dynamics, it keeps changing from one position to the other. But if you group everything, you have a, a kind of relatively smaller number of structures that it keeps visiting. So you can look at those. And we can extract from the whole molecular dynamics simulations, we can extract snapshots that represent 
that the best represents those structures that it visits more often. And that will give us a number of different structures from the same protein that we can now use for docking on the database. Uh, in this, in our case, basically we did this calculation here. We selected uh, five structures, and as I'm trying to show here, what we found is that we could use a different number of clusters, right, which would yield us a different number of structures. But what was very clear as I, we tried uh, a different number of clusters, and what got very clear to us is that they basically separated in one very popular populated cluster that's kind of centralized here in the structure, this, this light, a light brown structure here. And then there's basically two groups of less populated clusters. One with this flap here, let's say this flap is more open and one of it's more closed. So one way we could do is, uh, well, let's just uh, get the most, uh, <clears throat> Let's let's get uh, reduce the numbers, and we saw that as we reduced the number of clusters, this distribution didn't change much. So it was a nice uh, a nice compromise uh, having only five clusters. So we considered two to each side of the central one. Uh, and then what we do is th those. Uh, by the way, I'm just want to mention that the way this was done is look at the residues on the active site. We're just ignoring the rest of the movement and we're looking at how the, the positions of the residues on the active site move during the simulation. So uh, in, a, in a large number of clusters, you see basically 15,000 frames fall into this first one in the, the first category, category and the others are kind of distributed around it. So what we get now is for each one of those clusters, we do a scan of the drug bank database, okay, to find molecules that kind of fit into the active site of the structure. And uh, so basically we start this new, this most recent version of drug bank database has a total of 11, almost 12,000 compounds. And we filter those only for those that have 3D structures. There are proved molecules have already been approved for use uh, either in humans or some of them are veterinary use, but still they have gone through tests, have been approved. And uh, the 3D structure is available. So you filter for those, you get 1800 molecules. And then you've, uh, we have to create the, 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 the files for all those five clusters and then we go in, into the, the whole talking of those molecules into the uh, into the active site for each one of those 1800 molecules so what we find is uh, if you look at the each one of the structures we find uh, looking at the so basically we have for each one of the clusters we do the talking of those 1800 molecules and then we're looking now only at the 100 best molecules uh, the, molecule, the 100 molecules with the best uh, uh, binding energies from the whole set, okay, in each one of the clusters. So remember, uh, those clusters are the most populated one is the C0 here. And as you go to the right, you get least populated clusters. But still, if you look at the 100 molecules that bind best to the clusters, you know, they are in this range of... Uh, you know, 35 to 40 uh, K copper mole flex X score, which is kind of related to the, which is related to the binding energy. But we do have some molecules which, uh, which uh, seem to be very strong binders here. Another interesting thing is, uh, remember that we started with over one, uh, 1800 molecules that we are docking into different structures of the same protein. But where, so a total, uh, so 100 for each one of them. But if you look at which molecules are unique here, so for all the structures, we have only 225 unique molecules. So some molecules bind to more, bind well to more than one cluster here. And when we look at that, so we started with this, and we take only the unique ones, we have 225 molecules. 
And we're looking at these 225 molecules, we see that most of them, like 108 molecules, only bind to one cluster. They're very specific to one structure of the protein. Uh, but there are 30 of the molecules that bind well to all of the clusters. Okay. And this is interesting because it, it will be able to inhibit the, 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 the structure, it will be able to bind to the enzyme at whatever position it is, basically. So we chose those 30 molecules to take a closer look. And uh, into those, I'm just going to show you this. So we're looking into now, we're now looking into purchasing those molecules so we can test them against the, 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 the virus. And uh, just to give you an idea of the five best molecules there, so the five best binders. Okay, uh, this, so it's a, one is a kinase inhibitor that's used for leukemia and gastrointestinal tumors. One is an antibiotic. Actually, two of them is an antibiotic. One is a, a chelator that's used in Wilson's disease, and the other one is another chelase inhibitor, but used for tumors in animals. So the, uh, this is uh, basically what I uh, what we've done on, the, on this. I just want to thank you for your uh, kind uh, attention here. And I need to acknowledge uh, some people that work with us that, 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 that uh, make this possible. Uh, this, uh, the, the Center for Supercomputing that we used for running the simulations, the, the copies that paid some of the materials that we used for our collaborators. FACEPE is our uh, local uh, funding agency that actually pays for the machines that were, that were used. Professors Lindomar and Ronaldo are the ones that came initially with the idea of the 6-MMPR molecule to be used. Uh, I also collaborate with Professor John Bosco on a different project that I showed there. And some of the students that are responsible for the actual hard work involved in this. But with that, I'll, I'll thank you. Uh, I'll close and I take any questions you can have. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Gustavo, for this very interesting lecture <laughs> and for the good comic. And uh, whilst you can type in your question, I just want to uh, put your attention to the scientific challenge in which Gustavo took part of. It's uh, free access to our software for academics and the best person or the best proposal can win a travel grant. Unfortunately, Gustavo only got second. I don't know why, but he must have had a very <laughs> difficult year. <laughs> And uh, with that, I would kind